now, live now, a new Canadian television experience. Tonight's guest, Gary LeFay from the Edmonton Eskimos, Peter Mueller from the Toronto Argonauts, Ferguson Jenkins from the Boston Red Sox, and David Baines from Crossroads, and other musical guests. And now, here's the host of Alive Now, Paul Willoughby. Thank you, Cam. Good evening, and welcome to Alive Now. We're so glad that you've joined us again for the first late-night television interview program of its kind in Canada, and you're a part of it. It's my privilege right now to welcome to Alive Now three of the biggest guys I've come in contact with for a long time. Matter of fact, I'm glad we're not playing football tonight, and I'm glad I'm not on the opposing team because there's no way I'd want to face these guys. And I'm talking in particular about Gary Lefebvre of the Edmonton Eskimos, Ron Este of the Edmonton Eskimos, and Peter Mueller of the Toronto Argonauts. Welcome, Gary. Ron, Pete, Hello. God bless you. Hello. Good to have you. Tell me, Pete, Gary, and Ron, what's it like having three guys from opposing teams do an interview together? Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's uh, it's all right. Uh, we'll we'll let uh, we'll let Pete stay here with us. No, we love him. He's a, he's a brother in the Lord, and uh, no, I appreciate him being here, and it's great to see him again. We don't get to see him, except maybe a couple times during the year, and uh, maybe at our AIA conference in the off season. But uh, it's good to see him again tonight. Head on too, uh, Ron. <laughs> you're a defenseman, li defensive lineman. You've got to be very tough. How do you? Get yourself into shape to play that position. Oh, well, you start off with your frame of mind first, mental uh, ability as well as physical ability. You know, it says in the Bible, whatever comes out in you, whatever's in your mind mentally will come out sooner or later. Right. So if you just keep uh, thinking positive thoughts and have good uh, mental thoughts about anything you do, all the time being positive, and I got a little deal as I do it. Uh, try to do it as Jesus would have done it. Amen. And, uh, Praise God. It helps you out both in life, in family life, business, and in football. That's a tremendous motto to have. Whatever you approach, what would Jesus do in this situation? Peter, is it hard to play against a guy in another team when you know he's a fellow believer in Jesus Christ? No, <laughs> I, I find it exciting to do that. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Well, I'll tell you what happened. We're um, uh, we're playing uh, Edmonton this year <laughs> in, <laughs> in Toronto, and uh, uh, you like to uh, when you play. You know, you, you like Ron said, you want to do what uh, you think Christ would have done in that situation. I know there are a couple of times I didn't do what Christ would. Have. <laughs> we're on the goal line. I held Ron. <laughs> were you caught? By no, the I wasn't. The ref didn't see me. The Lord did. <laughs> <laughs> But Ron forgave you. <laughs> Peter, a couple of months ago, you shared with me that as a teenager, you attended church, and you found it to be most industrious. Oh, yeah. What did you mean by that? Yeah, I remember we were sitting in the balcony. This is long before I became a Christian, but I just happened to be going to church. And uh, we were sitting in the balcony, and as the fellow would be giving his sermon or his, his, his speech for that day, I'd, uh, um, uh, we'd, uh, I'd be looking through the hymn book. And you know that the hymn writers, they have their date of birth and their date of death, and I try to find the guy that lived the line. <laughs> and that was one of the things I did. And then when everybody prayed, um, I usually went to church with, a, with a, another fellow who played high school football with me, and we used to uh, exchange uh, football plays that we'd been writing down during the sermon. <laughs> we'd look at them, you know. So while the preacher was preaching, you were making football plays. Yeah. Did I, they work out? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we never used them, but... Uh, uh, I just look back on that time, and, uh, and you know, I went to church and everything, but I never really got anything out of it. And it wasn't until I <coughs> asked Christ in my life at college that... I want to ask you a question, Pete. I'm going to get to Ron and, and Gary. What led you then past simply formal church attendance to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? A lot of people simply go through the motions <laughs> of church attendance. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with church, mm -hmm. but church won't get you into heaven. No, no. Um, when I was in college, a quarterback on our team was a Christian. He said he was a Christian. I thought I was a Christian, too. But uh, he exemplified real, true qualities of, of Christ, uh, love and joy and peace and patience, things of that sort. 
and uh, he exemplified them on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, uh, he shared with me how I could uh, enter into this relationship with Christ. And it was a relationship with Christ he was talking about, not a religion uh, or a denomination or, or right. church attendance, but it was just a relationship with another person. Praise God. Gary, what place did God have in your life, say 10 years ago? <coughs> Absolutely none. Really? Five years ago, God did not have a place in my life. What was your upbringing, uh, your background? Unlike Pete's, uh, I never went to church at all, other than when I was seven years old, I have a little Bible on those little New Testaments that's got my name inscribed on it. So I know I went to Sunday school part of a year <laughs> when I was seven years old. I won't tell you the date that I <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but okay. Uh, that, that was really, uh, other than the odd uh, wedding or, or funeral, that was about the only time I stepped inside a church. And so I really had no religious upbringing whatsoever. And I met Christ at an Athletes in Action conference. Uh, well, it'll be five years this February. I was just going to ask you, Gary, how did you come to the place of turning things over in your life to Jesus? Oh, it's a long and involved story, but uh, to uh, make a long story short, uh, it was through the birth of my uh, first child, Cherie, our oldest girl, who's eight years old now. Uh, she was born retarded. She suffers from Down syndrome or Mongolism. And uh, up until that time, uh, everything was a bed of roses for me. I always had everything I wanted. Everything went well. You know, I had, this, uh, had the old silver spoon, so to speak. And uh, er everything I wanted, I always seemed to have. And everything was handed to me on a silver platter. And it wasn't until she was born. And uh, all of a sudden, there was something that I couldn't handle. And so I, I started to turn to God at that point and say, why? Why do these things mm -hmm. happen? Right. You know, why not to somebody else? And uh, she was kind of the beginning of my turning around, although I didn't completely turn around. I started to question at that time. And then uh, I kind of let it slip, <laughs> being a procrastinator that I am. <laughs> you have that problem too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, uh, somewhere down the road I'll find out, you know. Right. And I kind of let it go again. And, mm -hmm. and then God wrapped in my head again. And it was a, my second child, my, our boy, Bradley who was born with a very complicated intestinal defect and uh, spent the first 10 weeks of his life in the hospital and went through three major operations. But it was during those operations, and especially during the second one, that I turned around and faced God and started walking towards him. But I didn't meet him until a year ago, a, a year after that. Really? Until I found out that I could know him personally by inviting Christ into my life. So then your crisis situation, instead of turning you from God and away from God, actually drove you to him. Yes. I, I believe that's why God allows suffering and evil and, and things beyond our control to happen to us so that we d will turn to him. Gary, have you got something to say to the person who's listening tonight, that man who has been questioning, asking God, why did you allow that to come into my life? Yeah, well, th that's, what I, that's what happened to me. I said, God, why? Why have you allowed this to happen to me? And I started to question, and I said, well, and then I stopped to think about it, and I said, well, Lord, why, why am I asking why? You know, if you indeed are there and have allowed this to happen, then you've got to have a perfect reason for right, it. Right, right. And so I just sort of put my trust in, in, in his ability to, to handle the situation. And, of course, he brought me through it to himself. Praise God. I'd like to say to you tonight that your crisis situation does not need to defeat you. I want you to know it can be the starting point of you coming to the Lord in a new way of He becoming the Lord and Savior of your life. It will not be a bed of roses once you ask the Lord in. Gary, Ron, and Pete would share that. But you will find, you will have the presence of God to be with you in your life through every situation that comes your way. And that's the key. That's the important thing. Ron, when did you come to the Eskimos from the Lions? In 73. Uh, 73. Did you at that time, Ron, know the Lord? I believe that in 73, that you were the Western Conference All-Star Defensive Lineman that year, and that last year you were the nominee for the Shenley Award from the Eskimos. That's right. Uh, no, I didn't know Jesus Christ. I knew of God because I'm a Catholic, and uh, my mother, we had myself and two brothers, and they, you know, my mother kept bringing us to church every Sunday and uh, really never grasping the reality of God in Christ, but I 
always did have a fear of God, and I knew him, I talked to him, I prayed to him, but I never did know really Jesus Christ. The only thing I knew about Christ was, you know, for Christmas time, the, right. the time he was born. And when I came to the Eskimos in a, in a way that's, you know, it's just the Lord that led me there, <laughs> and it's just plain and simple. And uh, this, you know, they told me that be sure to talk to Gary when you get over there. <laughs> So the first guy I walk in the dressing room, the first guy I meet is Gary. Gary Lafayette. And it got to the point where Gary just kept coming to me every day and says, Ron, I got something to talk to you about, you know. And I says, no, Gary, leave me alone. I don't have time for that. I was in that, that time of real frustration and just, you know, fighting that I just got cut from BC and uh, getting another chance and I got to do good this time or something like this. And I got to the point where I told Gary, you know, keep bugging me, you know, just leave me alone, man. I'm going to <laughs> But he, he never quit. He, he just kept, kept coming, coming strong, and I'm glad he did. Isn't and that great? One day, he just happened. He says, uh, Ron, why don't you come over tonight? We have a Bible study. And I says, well, I, uh, I don't have no more excuses. I guess I got to go. But I could see a light in Gary, you know. Uh, you know, like this, you talk about the light, but you could see something with him. And I kept telling myself, I want to be like that guy. Praise God. And I says, well, I finally come to the end. That says, <coughs> well, only way I can be like him if I go with him. So that's what I did. And... I love Jesus now. Praise God. I thank God for that. And I know that there are a number of other players on the Eskimo team who've come to know the Lord too. I'm going to get to Gary in just a second, but Pete, I want to ask you. I believe some exciting things have been happening within the Toronto Argonauts, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. among some yes. players. Could you share that with us? Yeah, there are a number of players on our team who at this point are seriously considering um, committing their lives to Christ. Um, I don't want to embarrass them, you know, by mentioning their names or anything, but um, also certain members of our coaching staff and their really? wives. And uh, um, we have a conference, Gary mentioned a conference that we have once a year, and I wouldn't be surprised if we might get maybe half our team there. Isn't it's, that uh, fantastic? We've talked to most people on our team, and a lot of them are really excited about it. And uh, these people that who are now considering Christ, uh, are people who uh, uh, the public knows, I would say, as very independent, freewheeling uh, uh, people who don't seem to have any problems, but uh, their own personal lives have, have shown and pointed out to them that they need God's help, and they realize it now, and it's just a point of making a decision. Isn't that exciting? Pete, yeah. you and I had the chance, oh, two months ago now, to do an interview together. And uh, we interviewed you for our, uh, a radio program at that time. And also, I had the chance to interview Zen and Andrew Zishin. I'll mention his name because I know Big Z wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. He loves the Lord, and it's happening within the football team. Right. Uh -huh. Gary, what about the Eskimos? Now, there has really been, I understand, a revolution that's gone on within that team spiritually. And to God be the glory, you have been the kingpin in the sense that God has used you as an instrument. That's all we are, instruments. God has used your life. Well, I, I guess you could say I've been a kingpin in the sense that uh, when I committed my life to Christ uh, almost five years ago, uh, I was in Montreal at that time. And I had just, just after that, got traded back to the Eskimos. I know God had a hand in that too. And uh, when I got back there, I was the only professing Christian on the team. And I remember that whole year in 1972, I prayed all through the year. I think, Lord, please just give me one brother so I can <laughs> fellowship on this team. And before the end of the year, there was 10 different guys that had committed their lives to Christ. You're kidding. Praise yeah. God. A key word a you just said, professing. Professing right. Christian. Right. Instead of 007 secret agents. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> That's but, right. Uh, there are a number of uh, professing Christians on the team now. Uh, that are you know really committed to Christ and are willing to talk about it, like Ron and Stu Lang and Bruce Lemmerman and a number of others. I know Bruce is a brand new Christian as of January 19th of this year. Praise God. And uh, I know Ron and I prayed for him for three years, and um, God gave us the privilege, uh, my wife and I, of uh, him committing his life to Christ in our living room last January. Praise God. Uh, it's just a real blessing for us. The influence that you're having on their life, Gary. I believe that uh, you asked the Lord one time to give you an opportunity to witness, to share your faith in Jesus, and the opportunity came and you froze. What happened after that? 
all that. <laughs> yeah. I remember when that opportunity came, and I and I didn't know really what to say, and I just froze up. Uh, I remember I, last time I was talking to you. You in shared Toronto, that with you were, me, right? I shared that with you, and I said, Lord, if you give me another opportunity, I'll I'll I want to tell the world that I belong to you, and He did in uh, '73 Grey Cup, and uh, He worked it out so that I won that. Uh, <laughs> that Canadian, outstanding Canadian of the Game Award, and I got right. a chance to uh, tell everybody across Canada that was watching that game afterwards that uh, Jesus was my Savior. I remember that. And uh, praise God, it uh, opened up so many doors as a result of that. And uh, in fact, uh, there's one fellow that has been on crossroads that came out of that uh, uh, as a result of that, watched me, uh, was an alcoholic, and uh, a few months later was contemplating suicide and remembered what I had said on there. And phoned me long distance at Edmonton from Regina, and uh, committed his life to Christ, and as a, and didn't go through committing suicide, and he's living for the Lord today. Praise God. But uh, I'm sure there's probably other things that happened too. But I just so thankful that God gave me that opportunity to to do that. So then, Pete, it's important to speak your faith. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think it's something that, uh, as a Christian, you can't keep quiet. I mean, if you're really walking with God. I was going to ask. Basis. I was going to ask. Are there silent Christians? Are there double O oh, secret yeah. agents like uh, Gary secret mentioned? Service. <laughs> or do we really have to speak it out? I think you have to. Um, I, you know, I often think you know, like one of the verses in the Bible says, "Go and make disciples of all nations," and, and you know, share your faith. But I almost think that that'd be natural anyway. Um, Just a. I mean, uh, I heard Z uh, give a quote once. He said, "If if you had a cure for cancer, would you tell anybody?" And uh, the answer to me would be yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we as Christians have a cure for the, any any ill or any misfortune or any situation, you know, the, the world can come up with and uh, go tell people. Praise God. If you love Jesus, tell somebody about it. Because when Jesus Christ comes into your life, he doesn't come to hide in some secret corner. He comes to fill your entire life, to allow his love to show forth on your face, to let others know that the reason that you have joy in your life, that you can make it every day, is not because you've got a large bank account, is not because of prestige or power, but because of the indwelling of a person, Jesus Christ. And I want to share with you tonight, my friend, I want you to know that Jesus can do that in your life. As he has done it in Gary Lefebvre's life, in Red <coughs> Estate, in Peter Mueller's life, so he will do it in yours, if you will but ask him. God's word speaks to my heart. And there's a verse of scripture that's on my mind right now. It's found in John chapter 8. And it says this, that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But another verse says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The way to get truthful before God is to admit, Lord, I'm a sinner. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. I didn't say it. God's word, the Bible says it, and it can be counted on. And if you will but get honest with God and admit sin in your life, don't deceive yourself any longer. Ask the Lord to forgive you. The Bible further states that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness to make us new people. That's what's happened to Ron, to Peter, to Gary. That's what's happened to me. And that's why we're here tonight. Because of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Thanks for joining us. God bless you. Real good. Thank you for being part of Alive Now. If you have any further special needs or would like to be part of this faith ministry, we would like to hear from you this week. The address is Alive Now, Box 795, Kingston, Ontario. We will be sending to you by return mail, free and postage paid, our special book. That address once again, Alive Now. Box 795, Kingston, 
Ontario. If you have enjoyed this special telecast and would like it to continue, we need to hear from you today. That address, once again, Alive Now, Box 795, Kingston, Ontario. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless you.